Welcome to lecture 11. This week we're going to talk about the Gram-Schmidt process, orthogonal matrices and orthogonal diagonalization. We start with perhaps the key idea of this week's lesson, the Gram-Schmidt process. Every non-zero finite dimensional inner product space has an orthonormal basis. But the question I want to answer is, how can we find it? How can we find an orthonormal basis for any non-zero finite dimensional inner product space? We're going to be doing this in two steps. We're going to start with a basis that we know. We're going to use this to construct an orthogonal basis. That's the basis where the inner product between any two vectors is equal to zero. And then we're going to use that to create an orthonormal basis. Orthonormal means orthogonal and unit vectors. But the second step here is going to be quite easy. If we have an orthogonal basis, we can just normalize each vector. In other words, divide each vector by its norm to create unit vectors. For the first step, we need a method called the Gram-Schmidt process. And that's the one I'm going to talk about now. This is a process that we can use to convert a basis into an orthogonal basis. To do that, we need to perform the following steps. Step one is easy. Step one, we're just going to let V1 be exactly the same as X1. So no changes there. For step two, we're going to define our second new vector, V2, to be X2 minus the inner product of X2 and V1 divided by norm of V1 squared multiplied by V1. What does that mean? What that means is we're going to take x2, the second vector in the basis that we started with, and we're going to remove the part of that vector which points in the same direction as v1. Let me show you some pictures. Let's suppose we're starting with x1 and x2 looking like this. v1 we just say is the same as x1, and then we want to construct a V2 which is orthogonal to V1. This vector is pointing in the same direction as V1. This is a number multiplied by V1. And the number is in a product of X2 and V1 divided by the norm of V1 squared. Or if you prefer, we could put that up here. And then if we do X2 minus this black vector, we're going to get the vector v2. Now, if we've defined this correctly, v1 and v2 will be orthogonal vectors. Let's just check this. Are v1 and v2 really orthogonal? To answer that, we need to calculate the inner product and see if we get the answer 0. So we're going to do the inner product of v1 and x2 minus the inner product of x2 and v1 divided by the norm of v1 squared multiplied by v1. We're going to play with this and I'm going to show that this is equal to zero. The best thing to do is to break this up into two inner products by breaking at the minus sign. And then the first inner product is the inner product of v1 and x2, and the second inner product is the inner product of v1 and a number multiplied by v1. Well, if we have a number inside an inner product, we can always take it outside of the inner product. So that's inner product of v1 and x2 minus this number, inner product of x2 and v1 divided by normal v1 squared, multiplied by inner product of v1 and v1. 
but the inner product of v1 and v1 is just the norm of v1 squared. These two terms in red are going to cancel out, and we're left with inner product of v1 and x2 minus inner product of x2 and v1, which is equal to zero. So the answer is yes. If we define v2 like this, then v1 and v2 are orthogonal vectors. And then we carry on using the same idea. For v2, we took x2 and then we deleted something. We did minus the part of x2 which points in the same direction as v1. We'll do the same thing for v3. We'll start with x3 and then we'll subtract now two things. We'll subtract the part of the vector x3 which points in the same direction as v1. And then we'll subtract the part of the vector x3, which points in the same direction as v2. Now I'm going to leave it for you to check that if we define v1, v2, and v3 like this, v1 and v3 are orthogonal, and v2 and v3 are also orthogonal. Just do as I did for v1 and v2, calculate these inner products, and you'll see that you always get equal to zero because everything cancels out. And then we just carry on using the same idea. v4 is going to be x4 minus the part of x4 pointed in the section as v1, so that's inner product of x4 and v1 divided by norm of v1 squared multiplied by v1, and then minus the part of x4, which points in the same direction as v2, minus the part of x4, which points in the same direction as x3, as, as v3, and so on. That's the pattern. We can go on and on and on until we have vr. This is the key idea in this week's lesson. Most of the examples in this week's lesson will be using this process. So let me just repeat it. Anytime we want to chain, anytime we have a basis and we want to create an orthogonal basis, we use this process. First vector, exactly the same, no changes. Second vector, we do the new vector is the old vector minus the part of that vector pointing in the same direction as v1 and so on. Step three, we do v3 is x3 minus this number v1 minus this number v2 and so on. And we can go on and on and on to step 13, step 14, step 15 if we really wanted to, although we won't have any examples that big in today's lesson. So, for example, we're going to be using the vector space R3, and we're going to be using the Euclidean inner product. In other words, we're going to be using just the dot product of R3. Apply the Gram-Schmidt process to transform these basis vectors into an orthogonal basis, and then normalize these vectors to obtain an orthonormal basis. Step one, v1 is equal to x1. We don't change the first vector. So v1 is just 1, 1, 1. Step two, our formula is v2 is equal to x2 minus the inner product of x2 and v1 divided by normal v1 squared multiplied by v1. So we have x2 minus a number multiplied by v1. And what is the number? It's the dot product of x2 and v1, dot product of 0, 1, 1 and 1, 1, 1, that gives us 2, divided by the norm of v1 squared. And of course, the norm of v1 squared is 1 squared plus 1 squared minus 1 squared which is 3. 
we obtain our new vector minus two thirds, one third, one third. And then we keep going. We've got three vectors, so we're going to have three steps in our process. Before we do that, quickly check that we didn't make a mistake. Are these two vectors orthogonal? Calculate the dot product, we get zero, so yes. Move on to step three. For step three, the formula is V3 is equal to X3 minus a number V1 minus a number V2. And what are the numbers? First number is dot product of x3 and v1 divided by norm of v1 squared. I'll leave it for you to check that this number is one third. And the second number, dot product of x3 and v2 divided by norm of v2 squared. I'll leave it for you to check that this number is one third divided by two thirds. And then when we calculate this, we get our answer at zero minus a half, a half. Let's just check that we haven't made a mistake here. I've already checked that V1 and V2 are orthogonal. Let's also check if V1 and V3 are orthogonal. Calculate the dot product, we get zero, so yes. Are V2 and V3 orthogonal? Calculate their dot product, we get zero, the answer is yes. We didn't make a mistake here. We have an orthogonal basis for R3. The next step is to normalize these vectors. In other words, we're going to divide each vector by its norm to create a unit vector. I'm going to go back to slide seven. Where do we get these numbers? Look at step two. The two comes from the dot products of x2 and v1. x2 is the vector 0, 1, 1, and v1 is the vector 1, 1, 1. Do the dot product between these two, and we get two. For the three on the bottom, it's the norm of V1 squared. The norm of V1 squared, well that's one squared plus one squared plus one squared, or three. So that gives us the three on the bottom. Now looking at step three, where does the one over three come from? It's the dot product of x3 and v1, which is one, divided by the norm of v1 squared, which is did that, that's three. And then we also need the dot product of x3 and v2. Here's x3 and here's v2. Take the dot product of those two vectors, you get one third. Take the norm of v2 squared, and we get two thirds. Why? Two thirds squared is four over nine plus one third squared plus one over nine plus one over nine, that's four. So that's six over nine or two thirds. So we have our orthogonal basis. The next step is to normalize these vectors. 
We can calculate the norm of V1, the norm of V2, and the norm of V3. I'll leave these for you to check. And then we'll divide each vector by its norm to create these three unit vectors. For example, U1 is V1 divided by the norm of V1. So that's the vector 1, 1, 1 divided by the square root of 3. 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3. We now have three unit vectors which are each orthogonal to each other. So we have an orthonormal basis for R3. Let's do another example. Again, our vector space is going to be R3 with the Euclidean inner product. In other words, we're just using the dot product on R3. Let W be the span of X1 and X2, where X1 is the vector 3, 6, 0, and X2 is the vector 1, 2, 2. Construct an orthogonal basis for W. Before I do the calculations, let's just look at the picture I have here. V1 is going to be the same as X1. And then we want to construct a, a V2, which is orthogonal to V1. So V1 is going to look like this, exactly the same as X1. V2 is going to be orthogonal to it. We're going to take the, the part of X2, which is in the same direction as V1, and then subtract that from X2 to get this vector, V2. Okay, so let's do the calculation. V1 is always exactly the same as X1, so V1 is 3, 6, 0, nothing to change there. V2, the formula is, and you need to memorize this formula for the final exam, V2 is X2 minus the dot product of X2 and V1 divided by the norm of V1 squared multiplied by V1. On the top, we have dot product between, well, effectively these two vectors. So 3 multiplied by 1 plus 6 multiplied by 2 plus 0 multiplied by 2. That gives 15. And then we're going to be dividing by the norm of V1 squared. So that's 3 squared plus 6 squared plus 0 squared. 9 plus 36 gives us 45. And we get the answer V2 is equal to 0, 0, 2. And if I go back to the picture, yes, yeah, that looks right. That's what we expected. We expected 0, 0 something, and we got 0, 0, 2. So now we have an orthogonal basis for W. Let's do another example. Let x1 be the vector 1, 1, 1, 1, x2 be the vector 0, 1, 1, 1, x3 be the vector 0, 0, 1, 1, and these are vectors in R4, and we're going to be using the Euclidean inner product or dot product on R4. I'm saying it's easy to see that these three vectors are linearly independent, but why? I leave that for you to think about. Ask me on the discussion form later if it's not clear to you. We are asked to construct an orthogonal basis for the span of these three vectors. So we need to use the Gram-Schmidt process. V1 is the same as X1. Step one is very easy. So V1 is 1, 1, 1, 1. V2 is X2 minus inner product of X2 and V1 divided by normal V1 squared multiplied by V1. 
learn this formula. So that's 0, 1, 1, 1 minus 3 over 4 multiplied by V1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And that is equal to minus 3 over 4, 1 over 4, 1 over 4, 1 over 4. And then we could go on to step 3 and calculate V3 if we wanted to. But actually, we could do an optional step here just to make our calculations a little bit easier. Remember that we're trying to find an orthogonal basis. So that means we don't care how big or how long our vectors are. We only care that they're orthogonal. We can multiply our vectors by a number. It changes their length, it changes their norm, but it doesn't change the angles between them. So it doesn't change if they're orthogonal or not. So instead of dealing with this vector, which is could make our calculations a little bit complicated. What we can do is we can just multiply it by the number 4 and then instead of the vector we've calculated, we're going to be looking at a new vector in V2. Minus 3, 1, 1, 1. This is still orthogonal to V1, but because there's no quarters in it, it's going to make our calculation a little bit easier. Okay, then we can move on to step three and we can calculate V3. Here's the formula. You need to memorize this formula for the final exam. V3 is equal to X3 minus the inner product of X3 and V1 divided by norm of V1 squared, V1 minus inner product of x3 and v2 divided by norm of v2 squared v2. Put the vectors in, calculate the dot products, calculate the norms. I'll leave it for you to check later that the answer is 0, minus 2 thirds, 1 third, 1 third. And, <coughs> and then we could be finished. We found our v1, our v2, our v3. We could stop there if we wanted to, or again, we could multiply it by a number just to make the vectors a little bit easier to deal with. I want to do that here. I'm going to multiply my vector by the number 3, and I'm going to get a new vector, which I'm now going to call V3. I'm going to call it V3 equal to 0 minus 2, 1, 1. Then I have an orthogonal basis for W. Let's do another example. Let's talk about the vector space P2. That's the polynomials of degree two or less. And we're going to be using the inner product given here. The inner product of polynomial P and a polynomial Q will be the integral from minus 1 to 1, Px, Qx, dx. Apply the Gram-Schmidt process to transform the standard basis for P2, so that's the basis 1, x, and x squared, into an orthogonal basis. And these are called the, the Lagrange, we're going to be creating the Lagrange polynomials. And as far as I'm aware, this is the only known picture of this person. Okay, so we're going to start with the vectors or the polynomials. x1 is x1, x2 is x, and x3 is equal to x squared. And we're going to use the Gram-Schmidt process. Step one, that's the easy one. V1 is equal to X1, which is just the number one. For step two, we're going to need the inner product of X2 and V1. So let's calculate that first. The inner product of X2 and V1, that's the integral from minus one to one of x multiplied by 1, just here this is x 
multiplied by one. But the integral from minus one to one of x is just zero. So that's easy then. V2 is x2 minus a number multiplied by V1, but the number is just zero, so it's just x minus zero is x. And then we move on to step three. Again, I'm going to start by calculating the inner products first. First, I want the inner product of x3 and v1. x3 is x squared and v1 is the number 1. So I want the inner product from minus 1 to 1 of x squared multiplied by 1 dx. And that's 2 thirds. I want the inner product of x3 and v2. x3 is x squared. V2 is x, so x3 multiplied by V2 is x cubed. Integrate that between minus 1 and 1. It's an odd function, so we get equal to 0. And we're going to need one more thing. We're going to need the norm of V1 squared. Norm of V1 squared means inner product of V1 with V1. So that's the integral from minus 1 to 1 of... 1 multiplied by 1, and that's just equal to 2. Okay, those are the numbers that we need. Our formula is V3 is X3 minus the inner product of X3 and V1 divided by normal V1 squared of V1. Well, what do we have here? We have 2 thirds on the top and 2 on the bottom, minus the inner product of x3 and v2, well that's just 0. So it's x squared minus 1 third multiplied by 1 minus 0 multiplied by x. And then we're finished. Therefore, the set containing 1x, x squared minus a third, is an orthogonal basis for P2. We're going to need the Gram-Schmidt process later today, but first, we're going to change topic. Next, I want to talk about orthogonal matrices. We've done orthogonal sets, now orthogonal matrices. And I start with the definition. An invertible square matrix A is called orthogonal if and only if the inverse of A is equal to the transpose of A. So that's the same as saying that A multiplied by A transpose, or A transpose multiplied by A, is equal to the identity matrix. And we don't need to check both of these, we only need to check one. We could just check that A transpose A is the identity, or we could just check that A, A transpose is the identity. So, for example, I'm saying this matrix A is orthogonal. Why? Well, I'm going to leave it for you to check that if you calculate A transpose multiplied by A, then you get the identity matrix. Rotation matrices are orthogonal and reflection matrices are orthogonal. If you recall from lecture eight, the standard matrices for anti-clockwise rotation of arc by an angle of theta and for reflection about the x-axis are these matrices A and B. 
note that if we calculate A transpose A, I'll leave it for you to check, we get cos squared plus sine squared, or 1, 0, 0, and then again, cos squared plus sine squared, or 1. And likewise, if we calculate B transpose B, B is symmetric, so B transpose is just the same as B, that's like doing B squared. Again, we get the identity matrix. Therefore, these matrices A and B are orthogonal matrices. The first theorem for today, let A be a square n by n matrix. The following three conditions are equivalent. That means these three conditions are all true or these three conditions are all false for a particular matrix A. Condition one, A is orthogonal. That means A inverse is the same as A transpose. Condition two, the row vectors of A form an orthonormal set in Rn with the Euclidean inner product. And condition three, the column vectors of A form an orthonormal set in Rn with the Euclidean inner product. And I want to prove this. First, some notation. Let Ri be the ith row vector of A, and let Cj be the jth column vector of A. And I need row vectors and column vectors of A transpose. Let's call this Ri tilde for the ith row vector of A tilde, and Cj tilde for the jth column vector of A transpose. But wait a minute, when we do transpose, we swap rows with columns and we swap columns with rows. So that means the if row vector of A transpose must be the same as the if column vector of A, and the j column vector of A transpose must be the same as the j column, so j row vector of A. Okay. Now, what do we do if we multiply two matrices together? Well, really, we're multiplying rows in the first vector by columns in the second vector. So, for example, to create this entry, we take the first row of A and we multiply it by the first column of A transpose, and so on. But the first column of A transpose is the same as the first row of A. So R1 multiplied by C1 tilde must be the same as R1 dot R1, and the same in all of the other entries. Now, we can see from this formula that we can only have A, A transpose equal to I, if and only if these two things are satisfied. To get the identity, so that means one down the main diagonal, all of these green terms must be equal to one, and all of the orange terms must be equal to zero. But that's exactly the same as saying A, A transpose is equal to I, if and only if the set of row vectors of A form an orthonormal set in Rn. Now, to prove this, I start with A, A transpose equals I. If instead I started with the other way around, A transpose A equal to I, did exactly the same calculation, 
I could then prove that the column vectors of A form an orthonormal set in R. But I'll leave that proof for you to, to write. Let's move on to the next thing. Four facts about orthogonal matrices. Number one, the transpose of an orthogonal matrix is orthogonal. Fact number two, the inverse of an orthogonal matrix is orthogonal. Fact number three, if we take two orthogonal matrices and if we multiply them together, we obtain an orthogonal matrix. And fact number four, which is perhaps most interesting, if A is orthogonal, then the determinant of A is either equal to one or it's equal to minus one. I'm going to prove one and four. I'm going to leave two and three for you to do. First, let's prove number one. I want to prove if A is orthogonal, then its transpose is also orthogonal. So we're going to start by supposing A is orthogonal. We're going to start by supposing that A transpose A is the identities of A A transpose. And then I'm going to let B be equal to A transpose. And I want to prove that B is orthogonal. But B transpose is just A transpose entry, trans A transpose transpose, or A. So A transpose A is just the same as B B transpose, and A A transpose is just the same as B, B transpose B. That proves that the matrix B is also orthogonal. And then let's prove part four. If A is orthogonal, then its determinant must be either one or minus one. So we're starting by supposing that A is orthogonal. We're starting by supposing that A, A transpose is equal to I. But then that means that if we do the determinant of A multiplied by the determinant of A transpose, we get the determinant of A, A transpose, or the determinant of I. And the determinant of I is always equal to 1. What happens to the determinant of a matrix if we do a transpose of it? Nothing. Row expansion along A is the same as column expansion along A transpose. So determinant of A transpose is exactly the same as determinant of A. We get determinant of A squared is equal to 1, so we must have the determinant of A is either plus 1 or minus 1. For example, I'm saying that this matrix is orthogonal. Why? Because its row vectors form an orthonormal set in R2. Check that for me. Every orthogonal matrix must have its determinant equal to 1 or equal to minus 1. If we calculate the determinant of this matrix, and I'll leave that for you to check, we find that the determinant of this matrix is equal to 1 as the firm said it should be. I have another theorem coming up, but to be able to prove the next theorem, I need this formula. If u and v are vectors in Rn with the Euclidean inner product, then the dot product of u and v is equal to a quarter norm of u plus v squared minus a quarter norm of u minus v squared. 
And this is straightforward to prove. We'll just play with the, some algebra. The norm of u plus v squared, that means in a, or that means dot product of u plus v and u plus v. Multiply that out, that's norm of u squared plus 2 u dot v plus norm of v squared. And if we did the same thing with u minus v instead, we get almost the same thing, but we get a minus sign here. Norm of u squared minus 2 u dot v plus norm of v squared. And then take the difference between these two things. Norm of u squared will cancel out with norm of u squared. Norm of v squared minus norm of v squared. We left with 2u dot v plus 2 dot u, u dot v or 4u dot v. So that's this formula which we're going to need soon. Let A be an n by n matrix, the following are equivalent. That means these three rules are either all true or they're all false. If you can prove that one of these is true, then you know that the other two are true. If you can prove that one of these rules is false for your matrix, then you know that the other two are false as well. Property one, A is orthogonal. That's true if and only if the norm of AX is equal to the norm of X. For all vectors x and that's true if and only if ax dot ay is equal to x dot y for all vectors x and y so look at property two first property two says if a is an orthogonal matrix then x and ax have the same length Taking a vector and multiplying it by an orthogonal matrix does not change its length. And property three tells us that angles don't change. The angle between X and Y must be the same as the angle between AX and AY if we have an orthogonal matrix. Okay, I, let's prove this. And the way I'm going to prove it is I'm going to prove that property one implies property two, property two implies property three, and property three implies property one. And if we've done that, then we know that all three properties are equivalent. First, let's do property one implies property two. So we're going to be assuming that we know A is orthogonal, and then we're going to prove that A does not change the length of a vector. Let me remind you that the dot product of two vectors, what we can do is we can take the transpose of one of the vectors, it doesn't matter which one, either x or y, put that on the left and multiply it by the other vector. The dot product of x and y is the same as y transpose multiplied by x. So au dot v is the same as v transpose multiplied by au. Move the brackets, that's the same as a trans v transpose a multiplied by u. What happens if we take the transpose of two matrices multiplied together? We have to swap their order and then put the transpose on each one. So that means we get an equal sign here. Remember CD, transpose is D transpose, C transpose. So that's all I've done just here. But then that's just the dot product of U and A transpose V. So if we have an orthogonal matrix, so if we know that A transpose A is the identity, then 
norm of AX squared, that's AX dot AX. Do what we did up here. We said we can move the A across to the other vector as long as we do its transpose. So take this vector A, we can move this across as long as it becomes a transpose. That's the dot product of x and ix, or dot product of x and x, or norm of x squared. That proves 1 implies 2. If a is orthogonal, then the norm of ax is the same as the norm of x. Next, I want to pr prove that 2 implies 3. If we know that the norm of ax is equal to x, then I want to sh use that to prove that ax dot ay is equal to x dot y. And to do this, we're going to use the lemma that we've just done. ax dot ay is equal to By the lemma, a quarter norm of x plus a y all squared minus a quarter norm of x minus a y all squared. Instead of a x plus a y, I could do a multiplied by x plus y. And instead of a x minus a y, I could do a multiplied by x minus y. But wait a minute, we're assuming that property 2 is true. We're, we're assuming that the norm of A multiplied by any vector is just equal to the norm of that vector. And that's what I have here. I have norm of A multiplied by a vector. And then again, norm of A multiplied by a vector. By the assumption, we can just remove the A's to get a quarter norm of x plus y squared minus a quarter norm of x minus y squared. But that's just x dot y. This proves that if property 2 is true, then property 3 is also true. And then finally, we need to prove that 3 implies 1. So we're going to suppose that property 3 is true. We're supposing that x dot y is the same as ax dot ay, or write this another way, that's x dot a transpose ay. And we're going to use this to prove that a must be orthogonal. Rearranging this. Just taking what we had and rearranging it, zero, that's the number zero, is x dot a transpose a y minus x dot y. Or factorize it as x dot a transpose a minus i y. This equation holds for all vectors x and all vectors y. So in particular, we could choose any, we could choose any vectors that we want and put them into this equation. And the vector that I want to choose is I want to use x is a trans a minus i y. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that in into here. I'm going to get 0 is equal to this thing dot itself. But that just means the number 0 is equal to the norm of a transpose a minus i y squared. If a norm of a vector is equal to 0, that means the vector itself must be 0. But this must be true for all vectors y. 
doesn't matter which vector y we put in, we always get the zero vector. And that's only true if a transpose a minus i is the zero vector. Sorry, the zero matrix, I mean. Sorry, this, this two zeros here. First zero is a zero vector, and then the second zero here is the zero matrix. And that proves that A transpose is I, and then we're finished. If property three is true, then A is orthogonal. And that brings us to a nice place to take a break. Let's take a 10 minute break and then let's continue stay at 10 past three.
And then let's continue. I have one more topic for this week's lesson, orthogonal diagonalization. We did diagonalization a couple of weeks ago, but now we're going to do orthogonal diagonalization. But first, let me remind you of some previous ideas. Two square matrices A and B are called similar if there exists an invertible matrix P such that P inverse AP is equal to P. If somebody asks you to, to give them the definition of similar matrices, this is what you could write. If A is similar to a diagonal matrix D, by which I mean P inverse AP is D, then we say that A is diagonalizable and we say that P diagonalizes A. For example, look back at the ideas in lectures eight and nine. Sometimes it's possible to find an orthogonal matrix P such that P inverse AP is equal to B. But of course, orthogonal means P inverse is the same as P transpose. So that gives us the definition. If A and B are square matrices, then we say that A and B are orthogonally similar. If there exists an orthogonal matrix P such that P transpose AP is equal to B. So it's the same as similar, but P must be an orthogonal matrix. And then perhaps already you're guessing what orthogonal diagonalization means. If A is orthogonally similar to a diagonal matrix D, with P transpose AP as D, then we say that A orthogonally is orthogonally diagonalizable and that P orthogonally diagonalizes A. If P transpose AP is equal to D, then we can multiply on the left by P. And we can multiply on the right by P transpose to get P, P transpose, A, P, P, P transpose, which is P, D, P transpose. But of course, because P transpose P is just the identity matrix, this is just the same as saying A is equal to P, D, P transpose. What do we get if we take the transpose of both sides here? I would have A transpose on the left, and on the right I have P, D, P transpose, all transpose. How do we take the transpose of a product of three matrices? We have to change their order and then we put transpose on each one. So instead of red, orange, green, it's going to be the opposite, green, orange, red. And then we put transpose on each one. So P transpose, transpose, D transpose, P transpose. Now, P transpose transpose, that's just P. D is a diagonal matrix. And if we do transpose of a diagonal matrix, then we just get D. So that's just P, D, P transpose. A transpose is P, D, P transpose. But wait a minute. That's just A. So this shows that if A is orthogonally diagonalizable, then A must be a symmetric matrix.
then actually it's not just implies, it's actually if and only if. Theorem, let A be a square M by M matrix, and the following three conditions are equivalent. A is orthogonally diagonalizable if and only if A has an orthonormal set of N eigenvectors if and only if A is a symmetric matrix. So the orthogonally diagonalizable matrices is exactly the same as the symmetric matrices. I'm not going to prove this. You can look it up in a textbook if you want. Another theorem I'm not going to prove is this one. If A is an M by N square matrix, and if A is symmetric, then the eigenvalues of A are all real numbers. Here's a theorem I do want to prove. If A is a symmetric n by n matrix, then any two eigenvectors from different eigenspaces are orthogonal. So first of all, some notation. We want two different eigenvectors. We want two eigenvectors from two different eigenspaces. So we want x1 to be an eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue lambda 1. We want x2 to be an eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue lambda 2. And we want these to be different eigenvalues. And then to prove this theorem, we need to prove that these two eigenvectors are orthogonal. We need to prove that the dot product of x1 and x2 is equal to the number 0. And I'm going to do that like this. I'm going to start with lambda 1 x1 dot x2. x1 is an eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue lambda 1. So of course lambda 1 x1 is the same as ax1. Something we were doing earlier, if we have a dot product like this with a matrix, we can move the matrix across to the other vector as long as we take the transpose of the matrix. So just as we were doing earlier, that's the same as x1 dot a transpose x2. We're doing this for a symmetric matrix. So a transpose is exactly the same as a. But a x2 is the same as lambda 2 x2 because x2 is an eigenvector. Lambda 2 is just a number. It doesn't matter where we put a number here. Let's just move the number to the front. That's lambda 2, x1 dot x2. Rearrange this. That means that lambda 1 minus lambda 2 multiplied by x1 dot x2 is the number z. But lambda 1 is not equal to lambda 2. So the only way this could be equal to zero is if x1 dot x2 is equal to zero, and that finishes the proof. Okay. How do we orthogonally diagonalize an n by n symmetric matrix? We're only doing this for symmetric matrices because only symmetric matrices can be orthogonally diagonalized. 
the A, B, and N by the symmetric matrix with real entries. Step one, we want to find a basis for each eigenspace of A. But that's not enough. We don't just need a basis, we need an orthogonal, actually an orthonormal basis. So step two is to use the Gram-Schmidt process on each one of these bases to obtain an orthonormal basis for each eigenspace. And I'm going to call these vectors u1, u2, up to un, because they're unit vectors, so I'm using the letter u. Step three, the matrix we want is the matrix where the first column is u1, second column is u2, dot, 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 second column, of, so final column is un. And then we're finished. Then the matrix P will, will orthogonally diagonalize A. Now this is the same idea that we were using before. If you've been doing your revision to be ready for tomorrow's exam, how, did, how do we diagonalize a matrix? Well, we don't do step two here. We do step one, find a basis for each eigenspace, and then write those as columns of the matrix P. So the idea here is the same, except we have this extra step two if we're going to orthogonally diagonalize a matrix. This topic is not on tomorrow's exam, but you might be asked to diagonalize a matrix tomorrow. So that would be step one and step three tomorrow. Maybe in the final exam you're given an orthogonally diagonalizable question, and then you would need to do all step one, step two, and step three. As before, as when we were doing diagonalization, the eigenvalues on the main diagonal D will be in the same order as their corresponding eigenvectors in P. So let's do an example. Find an orthogonal matrix P which diagonalizes this matrix A. Well, first we need the eigenvalues and we need a basis for each eigenspace. And I'm not going to do all the details here. Please check that this is the characteristic equation for this matrix. And then we can see that the eigenvalues of A are lambda is 2 and lambda is 8. We have two eigenspaces and we need a basis for each eigenspace. And I'm not going to do the details here. Please check first that these two vectors give a basis for the eigenspace corresponding to lambda equal to 2. So that would be step one done, at least for the first eigenspace. We need to use the Gram-Schmidt process on x1 and x2 to obtain an orthonormal basis. Here's everything that we need to do, but with, with gaps in. We need V1, that's just going to be the same as X1. We need to calculate V2. The, the Gram-Schmidt formula is X2 minus inner product of X2 and V1 divided by normal V1 squared, V1. We're just doing dot product. Anytime you're not told what inner product to use, it's always just going to be the dot product or the Euclidean inner product. And then after we've got v1 and v2, we're going to normalize these two vectors to get our orthonormal basis. Okay, let's start filling in these four blanks. First of all, v1 is the same as x1. 
So that's easy. V1 is minus 1, 1, 0. And then V2 is X2 minus X2 V1 divided by normal V1 squared V1. What is the dot product between X2 and V1? Well, that's the same as saying, what's the dot product of the two vectors in the yellow box? Minus 1 multiplied by minus 1 is 1. 1 multiplied by 0 is 0. 0 multiplied by 1 is 0. The dot product of these two vectors is just 1. What is the norm of V1 squared? Minus 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 0 squared is 2. So this number here is just going to be 1 over 2. x2 minus a half v1 gives us the answer at minus a half minus a half 1. Then we want to normalize these vectors to obtain unit vectors. The norm of v1 is root 2, so v1 divided by norm of v1 is minus 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2 is 0. And the norm of V2 is going to be root 6 over 2. So U2, V2 divided by norm of V2 is minus 1 over root 6, minus 1 over root 6, 2 over root 6. As always, I'm relying on you to check my calculations here because I do sometimes make little mistakes when I do these slides. So if when you have a, a free moment, just check this for me and let me know if I've made a mistake, please. So that gives us an awful normal basis for the first eigenspace. We also need to do the same thing for the second eigenspace. I'm going to leave it for you to check that the eigenspace corresponding to lambda e equals 8 has the basis 1, 1, 1. We've only got one vector here. So what we can do is we can skip the Gram-Schmidt process and just move straight on to normalizing this vector. Why will the formula would be v3 is equal to x3, and then we would normalize it. We're just creating extra work for ourselves. So just straight away, let's just normalize this, and then we'll be done. The norm of x3 is going to be root 3. So our third and final unit vector is going to be 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3. Now that we know our u1, our u2, and our u3, we can write down the matrix P, because P is the matrix where the first column is u1, second column is u2, and the third column is u3. So we just write the numbers in, and then we've got our matrix P. I leave it for you to check that if we calculate P transpose AP, that's this matrix multiplied by that matrix multiplied by that matrix, we get the diagonal matrix with entries 2, 2, and 8 down the main diagonal. The first two numbers are 2 because we did the eigenspace corresponding to 2 first, and that had two eigenvectors. And then the third one is 8 because we've just done the eigenspace corresponding to 8. Let's do another one. Orthogonally diagonalize this matrix A. Again, look, this is a symmetric matrix because we can only do this for symmetric matrices. This time I'm going to do more of the details. 
First, we need the eigenvalue. So first, we need the characteristic equation. 0 equal to the determinant of lambda i minus a is the characteristic equation. If we were asked for characteristic polynomial, then we just do determinant of lambda i minus a. So we need the determinant of lambda minus 3, 6, 0, 6 lambda minus 6, 0 minus 6 lambda plus 3. I'm going to do cofactor expansion along the first row. So first of all, lambda minus 3, and it's going to be plus. Remember, talking back to the checkerboard, plus, minus, plus, etc. Multiplied by the determinant of lambda minus 6 minus 6 lambda plus 3. And then moving along the first row, minus 6 multiplied by the determinant of 6 minus 6 is 0, lambda plus 3, and then plus 0. Two by two determinants are easy to write down. First one, lambda, lambda plus three minus five, six. And the second one is lambda, so six, lambda plus 18. Multiply that all out, rearrange. Lots of terms cancel and we're left with lambda cubed minus eight to one lambda, which is the same as lambda, lambda minus nine, lambda plus nine. So we have three different eigenvalues, lambda equal to zero, lambda equal to nine, and lambda equal to minus nine. We need a basis for each eigenspace. But because these are one-dimensional eigenspaces, that really means we just need an eigenvector corresponding to each eigenvalue. Next, we need to find bases for the eigenspaces. Since we've got three different eigenvalues, each eigenspace will be one-dimensional. So we just need one vector in each eigenspace. First, let's do lambda equal to zero. I'm taking my matrix A and I'm row reducing it to get one zero minus one zero one minus half zero zero zero. And then I can find a basis for this null space is given by, for example, the vector 1, a half 1. I remind you that elementary row operations do not change a null space. So that's the first eigenvector. Next, let's do lambda equal to 9. So we need the null space of a minus 9i, or that's the same as the null space of 9i minus a. Take a minus 9i, row reduce it, and then we can find a basis is given by minus 2, 2, 1. And then finally, we need to do the third eigen value, so third eigenspace. Take a minus minus one i and row reduce it. I'll leave it for you to check that we get one zero a half zero one one zero 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 and then we can see that the basis for this eigenspace is given by minus a half minus one one. Do please check these please. We've got three eigenspaces, and each one only contains one vector in its basis. So we can skip the gram schmidt process. We really only need to do, do gram schmidt if we have two or more vectors. Straight away, we can move on to normalization. We can calculate the norm of each of these vectors. Actually, it's easier to calculate the norm of the vectors squared. 
and then we can divide each vector by its norm. U1 is x1 divided by the norm of x1, so that's two-thirds x1. U2 is x2 divided by norm of x2, one-third x2. And U3 is going to be x3 divided by norm of x3, two-thirds x. Oh, typo just here. This should be x3. So we have our U1, we have our U2, and we have our U3. We've done the work then. We can write down our matrix P. The P, first column is U1, second column is U2, third column is, again, another typo, should say third column is U3. I'm going to leave it for you to check that this is the right matrix. If you calculate P transpose AP, you will get this diagonal matrix where the entries on the main diagonal are the eigenvalues of A. I'm going to do one more example. Or functionally diagonalize the matrix A. And this time we're told the characteristic equation is zero is equal to lambda minus seven squared and lambda plus two. That'll save us a little bit of work. Step one, find a basis for each eigenspace. I'm skipping that calculation this time. Please check this for me. Note that x1 and x2 are linearly independent, but they're not orthogonal. So that means we need to use the Gram-Schmidt process for the eigenspace corresponding to lambda equal to 7. So how do we do Gram-Schmidt? First one is easy. V1 is equal to x1. First vector doesn't change. V1 is always equal to x1. V2, the formula is x2 minus inner product of x2 and v1 divided by normal v1 squared, v1. And for us, x2 inner product with v1 is minus a half, norm of v1 squared is 2, so v2 needs to be minus a quarter, 1 a quarter. And if you want to, you could pause here just to take the inner product or dot product of these two vectors and just check that you get equal to 0. As long as you know you're getting equal to, as long as you find you're getting equal to 0, you haven't made a mistake. So that gives us an orthogonal basis, but that's not enough. We also need an orthonormal basis. So we have to normalize these vectors. We need to divide the vectors by the norms. To calculate u1 is 1 over root 2, 0, 1 over root 2, and u2 is minus 1 over root 18, 4 over root 18, 1 over root 18. The eigenspace corresponding to lambda equal to minus 2 only has one vector. We don't need to do Gram-Schmidt. We just need to normalize our eigenvector to get a unit vector. So x3 divided by norm of x3 is, you can check, minus two-thirds, minus one-third, two-thirds. And then we've done the work. 
the matrix P that we want is the matrix first column U1, second column U2, third column U3. And the diagonal matrix D is going to be the diagonal matrix with eigen values on the main diagonal. U1 corresponds to seven, so the first number is a seven. U2 is an eigenvector corresponding to seven. So again, we get a seven. And then finally, U3 is an eigenvector corresponding to lambda equal to minus two. So finally, we get minus two. Then P orthogonally diagonalizes A, or we could write A is equal to P, D, P transpose. No lesson next week. In two weeks' time, we will have our final lesson. The next lesson, the final lesson, is mostly about singular value decomposition, which is similar ideas to diagonalization. It's a way of writing a matrix is equal to a product of three matrices, but it's a little bit more advanced. But before I do that, I need to talk a little bit more about A transpose A. The midterm exam is tomorrow and it will cover materials from lectures 7 to 10. Are there any questions? Find a linear transformation from P2 to P1 by T of A T squared plus B T plus C is equal to 
3a minus bt plus 2b minus c. Find polynomials which span the kernel of t. Okay, so kernel means that t of a polynomial is equal to zero. So we need to start by zero is equal to t of at plus bt plus c. So that's zero, zero is equal to matrix multiplied by abc. And the only way to do that is if 3a is equal to b and 2b is equal to c. Okay, I have the file now. So, 2a, we're trying to find the kernel of this 
linear transformation t. Kaido means equal to zero. So we're going to start with zero is equal to t. Zero is equal to at squared plus bt plus c, which is then equal to three a minus b t plus two b minus c. We need to find the a, b, and c, which mean which make this always equal to zero. So it needs to be equal for t equal to one, equal to zero for t equal to two, equal to zero for t equal to three, and so on. If we put t equal to zero, then we just end up with two b minus c. So we must have that zero is equal to two b minus c. We also need this to be equal to, say, t equal to 1. So we also need to have 0 is equal to 3a minus b. So the kernel is all of the vectors or all of the polynomials which satisfy these two equations. We must have that 2b minus c is 0, and we must have that 3a minus b is equal to 0. So, for example, if we choose c is equal to 1, b must be 2, and if b is 2, a must be 6. That's the only possibility. We could have multiples of this, but there's only going to be one vector in a basis for the kernel of t. So the kernel of t, if I can make my writing a little bit smaller, the kernel of t is going to be the span of the polynomial 6t squared plus 2t plus 1. I got that the wrong way around. Yeah, I got that the wrong way around, didn't I? Start again. Zero is equal to let's try this. Kernel means t of a ve vector is equal to zero. The vector is in the kernel if and only if t of the vector is equal to zero. So to do this calculation, we start with zero is equal to t of a polynomial, and we need to find the a, b, and c which satisfy this. For us, that's 3a minus b t plus 2b minus c. We need to choose a, b, and c which satisfy this. If, for example, t is equal to 0, then this just becomes 0 is equal to 2b minus c. So that tells us that 2b must be equal to c. Whatever value we take from b, c must be double. If, say, we put t equal to 1 there, remember the next one is always equal to 0, t is equal to 1, we must have that 0 is equal to 3a minus b. 
Or to write that another way, we must have that 3a is equal to b. This is our two equations. We're looking to solve 2b is equal to c, and we want to solve 3a is equal to b. So we could choose one of these numbers to be 1. Let's say we choose a is 1. A is 1, then B must be 3. If B is 3, then C must be 6. So the panel of T, that must be the span of all of the polynomials which have B is 3 times A, and C is 2 times B. So the kernel of T must be the span of T squared plus 3T plus 6. The teacher that wrote the solution to this didn't want to use in polynomials. The, the teacher that did this wanted to change to doing um, matrices and vectors. So they're using the property that P2 is isomorphic to R3. And then using the isomorphism AT squared plus BT plus C maps to the vector ABC in R3. And then they're answering it for matrices acting on R3. And then at the end, they change back to doing polynomials. Okay, let's look at part B. Find a basis for the range of T. Okay, so 
The first thing to remember is that rank plus nullity is equal to the dimension of the domain. So for us, rank plus nullity is equal to its true. Nullity means the dimension of the kernel. We found that the kernel has just one vector in its basis. So the dimension of the kernel, I, should, I, I mistyped that, the dimension of the kernel is equal to one. So the rank must be two. But the rank is the dimension of the range. So the range is two dimensional. The range is a two dimensional subspace of P1. So the rule is rank plus nullity is dimension of the domain. Our domain is P2, that's three-dimensional, so rank plus nullity is equal to three. We know that nullity is equal to one, so we know that the rank is two, so the range must be a two-dimensional subspace of a two-dimensional vector space. there's only one two-dimensional subspace of a two-dimensional vector space. It's all of the vector space. The range of T must be all of P1. So once we've understood that, part B is just saying find a basis for P1. That's easy. We know a basis for P1. Basis for P1 is just the set containing 1 and T. Part C, find a polynomial such that T of P is equal to 3 plus 40. And I see that they, they didn't write an answer to this, so what do we do? So we have 3 plus 40 equal to t of p. So that's equal to, go out to the top, 3a minus b. t plus 2b minus c. So 3a three three a minus b must be the same as 4. And 2b minus c must be the same as 3. That gives us two equations to play with. Find a solution to this and we're done.
ภาพปีละละปีปี this triangular matrix what what value of x what must be the value of x so that b is diagonalizable a matrix is diagonalizable if it has four linearly independent eigenvectors Because we've got repeated eigenvalues, one, two, three, and three, we might not necessarily have four linearly independent eigenvectors. Eigenvectors from different eigenspaces are linear independent, but Let's have a look. Okay, so if we put x equal to zero, line two says zero, 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 one. So that tells us the fourth position must be zero. So we can forget about um, the final column. Row one then says minus one, 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 zero, let's say. So that's going to be minus x one. That's not, I should use a different um, notation perhaps. Let's say minus a plus b plus c is equal to zero where we're looking for the vector a, b, c, zero. All of the 
eigenvectors satisfy minus a plus b plus c is equal to zero. And a good, a nice, easy way to then find some eigenvectors is to choose some of these. Let's, so we could choose, let's say, 1 and 0. If I choose b is 1 and c is 0, then a must be 1. So we will get 1, 1, 0, 0. Or I could choose them in a different way. Instead of choosing b is 1 and c is 0, I could instead choose b is 0 and c is 1. And then again, a is 1. So then I would get the vector 1, 0, 1, 0. And that would give me two linearly independent eigenvectors.
Thank mm -hmm. you. 